Sankal Gupta, representing Intelica Advisory Services. Welcome you to the Sankal Global Summit 2021. The session, which is key today, uh, talking about key problem of bridging the financing gap for electric vehicles, specifically in India. The idea of this session is we all know that the India's transition to electric vehicle will require a cumulative capital investment of dollar to 26, 266 billion. And we also know that the market size of EVs would be around dollar 50 billion about 80% of India's retail, retail finance industry current size. So we really have this problem of, you know, how we can support this EV sector with the finance that is required at a large scale. And this required financing will also towards vehicle finance, um, you know, charging infrastructure, other ecosystems that we need to build so that we can create the sustainable ecosystems for promoting this electric vehicle industry in India. Financial institutions such as banks, NBFCs, government, industry, everyone, including entrepreneurs, need to come together and create this sustainable ecosystem, which provide so, and, and where we need to provide financing, not just for entrepreneurs, but also for consumers to ensure the uptake of electric vehicles in India. With this uh, context, we have, uh, uh, <clears throat> we have the esteemed panelists today with us. Uh, I'll just introduce you. We have Karthik Gopal, who is uh, the Global Energy uh, Electric Vehicle Finance Specialist at IFC. Mr. Sebin Basiat, who is the who is currently leading the transport sector as well as the energy efficiency sector at uh, Green Climate Fund. Mr. Sampath Kumar, who is currently the business head and business development uh, head of uh, Tata Clinton Capital. And Mr. Jaibir Singh, who is currently an entrepreneur and CEO of uh, a company called Il Kabira Mobility. So it's really um, interesting uh, panel that we have uh, we have a representation from entrepreneurs, financial institutions, and PFCs and, and capital providers. And we would love to hear from each of one of them in terms of how we can streamline the capital for electric vehicles in India today. With that, I'll, uh, we have a moderator who will just joining us shortly. Uh, so in the, in, the, in the meantime, I'll just request each one of uh, our panelists to give us small introduction, introductory remark in terms of how they see the electric vehicle industry at, in, in India today and how they are planning uh, to support the electric vehicle industry in a brief, uh, which, which will further be taken up, uh, taken up by Swati once she joins. So uh, why don't Karthik, uh, we'll hear from you in terms of what uh, in your in brief introduction and how you see the electric vehicle industry in India currently. Thank you very much, Ankit. And, uh... Uh, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. Um, I'm Karthik. Um, I serve at uh, the International Finance Corporation, which is a part of the World Bank Group. To very quickly set the context, the World Bank Group has five separate institutions, of which IFC is one of them. IBRD, which is typically just called the World Bank, is actually IBRD, uh, which uh, funds um, programs in the private sector, sorry, in the public sector and government projects, IFC funds the private sector. So that's how we work together. Um, coming to the EV space, so my role here is to look at IFC's um, the strategy for IFC's investments in the EV sector across developing markets. IFC is a development finance institution, so we work in developing markets. Um, coming to the context in India, obviously, I think there is a significant increase in interest and activity uh, in the space. Um, and that's very heartening to know and, and notice. Uh, I've been in the EV industry for a little over a decade now, and I've never seen this level of fervent activity across the value chain uh, from different actors, both incumbents as well as uh, startups, uh, trying to uh, rebuild the whole mobility and transport sector. So I think a very exciting time to be a part of this journey. Uh, you rarely get to see an entire industry getting going through a transformation. So it's, it's a very exciting time. Obviously, it has its challenges and its um, uh, issues to be resolved. Um, I would leave the financing specific topics to a later point in time, but I think so. certainly it's a, a very, very exciting time to be in, in this sector. Thank you. Great. Thanks, thanks, Karthik. Jaibir ji, um, your views on uh, your introduction uh, so, and your views uh, on the EV industry currently. Uh, hi, everyone, and good morning. Uh, myself, Jaibir Shivaj. Basically, uh, I'm an uh, engineer from Indian Navy. 
I worked for Indian Navy, and later on I joined to the I taken this project Kabira Mobility. Actually, uh, we uh, Kabira Mobility uh, we started this project in 2017, and looking at the uh, future of the Kabira this uh, overall industry, electrical vehicle is a big space that everyone need to accept it, and uh, the as a OEM or a manufacturer point, we look very uh, uh, a big scope where we need to uh, bring the product as per the public requirement or as per the uses and uses. So it cannot be just broad and fit anything. It is what the public requires. So we uh, that is what the space which is a huge and entire. We look upon the entire two wheeler, four wheeler, or buses or even train and all the industry should be going into the electric in complete five maybe. 2025 or 2026 it depend upon our government mission and our acceptability. But uh, fossil fuel and uh, this coal and all we can all feel around is going to be a short vision and going to be out of the market. But my opinion, we are looking very positive about this. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, JBG. Seven, uh, uh, a brief introduction and your perspective on the EV sector. Um, th th thank you so much, Ankit, and, and, and thank you so much for the invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to be in this uh, panel with these esteemed um, panelists. Um, um, so my name is Sabine Basnet. I am the, the Senior Energy Efficiency uh, Specialist at the Green Climate Fund, and I also lead both, like uh, Ankit said, uh, the, the energy efficiency sector, as well as the transport, uh, our low emission transport sector. Um, so, I mean, just a way of introduction, I mean, uh, the Green Climate Fund is the largest dedicated climate fund uh, in the world. I and mean, we were set up uh, as part of the UNFCCC, uh, the financing arm of the UNFCCC, to really kind of, you know, um, uh, promote climate action and to really get, you know, investments in climate um, uh, up and running. So we actually work across eight um, results areas, which basically mean both mitigation and, and adaptation. And out of the eight, uh, low emission transport is one of the, our key uh, sectors for us as well. Um, and uh, in, in terms of how we do things, I mean, uh, I think we'll probably get to more financing and Kartik's gonna uh, talk about how IFC does things. Uh, we, unlike the IFC or other um, financial institutions, we do not work directly in financing. So what we do is we finance via partners uh, who we call accredited entities. So, uh, so generally, if, if there is a project to be had, let's just say in India uh, for you know, public transport somewhere on EVs, uh, you know, that project would have to go through uh, one of our uh, accredited entities and then that would come to us and then we would basically work with them to finance the project. So it's, it's not, I mean, so I think that, I just wanna get that off the, the bat right now so that, you know, so that we can you know, uh, start uh, discussing this much more in depth when we go forward. But uh, in terms of what we see in terms of um, the scope uh, within the sector, I mean, like uh, Karthik said, I mean, uh, when I first joined the fund three years ago, um, we were looking at you know, BRT systems with CNG and all of those kind of things. But now that has really flipped. So all of our uh, transport pipelines are all electric vehicles. I mean, it's electric vehicles in the public fleet, it's in the shared fleet, it's two wheelers, three wheelers. You, 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 you talk about anything with wheels, um, it, it's got electric <laughs> attached to it. So I think you know, it, it is a very, very interesting time. Uh, and then I think this is, uh, and then I was also mentioning this to Ankit as well as, I think this is the proper time to be discussing this, um, uh, this topic and then and for India as well. And I think the, uh, the, the amount and the resources that are there as well as the need and the demand in the country is huge. And I think it's, you know, once we, you know, we should start looking at it and talking about it uh, much more quickly so that we can actually get some things uh, up and running so that, you know, it becomes um, uh, a catalyst to much more. Um, so, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, over to you, Ankit. Thanks, thanks Sabin. Sampat, uh, it will really be interesting to hear your views on your brief introduction and your views on the EV industry. Sure, sure, Ankit. Uh, uh, thank you so much for uh, having me on this panel. It's a real pleasure. Uh, well, I, I'm just representing TCCL on this uh, platform today. Uh, as you know, uh, and as most people are aware of, uh, TCCL, Tata Clean Tech Capital, we are an NBFC and we finance uh, projects in the clean tech and the infrastructure space. We provide both uh, financing as well as uh, advisory solutions to our uh, clients. Uh, one of the things that we also do is that we also help channelize uh, 
resources into into the into these sectors into into the sectors that we operate in and we essentially act as an entity or a vehicle through which you know some of the multilaterals and dfi sort of channelize their funds uh, for uh, onward lending into into the spaces that we operate in uh, and yes uh, uh, it's it's, uh, it's it's a great time to discuss about uh, evs it's obviously you know lots of opportunities in this space at this point of time as we speak lots of uh, lots of uh, lots of news lots of uh, and of course lots of opportunities also bring along lots of challenges and and lots of uh, and lots of issues that we uh, we have to deal with and looking forward to sort of discuss that on the panel today thank you so much thanks great 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 uh, i'll just take one question uh, kartik we can start from with you what is the ifc's approach to fighting climate change and in that how the overall ev sector fits in and how you are currently financing some of the what are some of the key initiatives that is driving towards supporting ev sector in india today? thank you ankit so um, let me start at the world bank group level because i think it's important to set the broader context of how we look at climate finance as a whole we are a development finance institution unlike green climate fund we are not exclusively a climate bank but uh, there is a lot that we are trying to do in the space to give a sense of numbers globally the world bank group has funded climate aligned projects to the tune of about 20 billion dollars in 2020 in 2020 and that number is set to increase dramatically the reason i say this is that the world bank recently announced that our targets that um all the ibrd world bank funded projects would be completely paris aligned which means that they would every project in that particular country if that project is aligned with the country's uh, ncds then it would be funded by us otherwise they are not eligible for funding by us this will happen by 2023 for the world bank and 2025 for ifc ifc would hit 85% by 2023 so we are very very committed to make sure that all our financing is in general very climate aligned that's the first point i wanted to make and we do work at a reasonably significant scale of financing every year uh, so that's the broader context coming specifically to uh, mobility as a, as such um so one of the things that uh, it's also important to keep in mind from ifc's context is that we are typically uh, our ticket sizes are large and we are um in in terms of equity we do equity debt and various shades of debt and so and uh, and in some cases blended finance but um we are typically in the equity side a later stage investor which means that we would come in generally at a series b and our ticket sizes go upwards of 10 million for not more than a 20% stake we never are a majority uh, investor in in a, in a company so these are some of the constraints from an ev perspective and i'm bringing up this point because <clears throat> in developing markets globally not just in india the ev sector in the private space is not yet except for a couple of companies uh, there are not a lot of opportunities that are at the scale at which a large scale development finance institution can come in and put an equity in it but having said that we are working very uh, systematically to make sure that there are opportunities that are created uh, to build out that pipeline so there is an entire function within ifc called upstream and the upstream team at ifc jointly with the world bank did a very large scale uh, study in in india uh, to look at the bus sector the two wheeler three wheeler and four wheeler sector the charging infrastructure space and based on which one of the areas that we have clearly identified is around the issues of financing of evs and uh, i can't speak too much because it's still a work in progress but there is a very large scale uh, program that is being developed to address some of the financing challenges in this space so that is something as and when it it gets um, firmed up it will be announced but um so we we work at scale and we try to bring in um uh, changes and and policies that can build broad based systemic approaches to to enabling the sector so i would leave it at this point i i want uh, to hear from the other panelists as well but there are a lot more specific and detail that we are working on which i can touch upon at a later point in time as well thank you very much thanks i believe swati is back so yes, uh, yes swati uh, we had a brief introduction of the panelists and yes. i asked the initial question to karthik in terms of what's the ifc's approach to uh, ev uh, support support to the ev sector is thank you ankit thank thanks for filling in yeah.
Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, uh, welcome everyone and thank you uh, for being patient and sorry for the delay. I had a, you know, I mean, the job of a journalist usually is like breaking hours all the time. So I had to be on TV for a brief live program. But anyway, I'm back. And I'm really looking forward to some great inputs from everybody, especially at a time when electric vehicles, it's, it's a subject very close to my heart. So personally, I'm looking at it very closely. And of course, I'm in touch with a lot of stakeholders. I'm going to get some good inputs, I'm hoping, because uh, the timing is absolutely, uh, you know, uh, uh, perfect, I would say in many ways. You heard Tata, uh, and I'm sure all of us uh, know about it. It was just yesterday that they did, uh, uh, TPG did come in and invest in a big way in Tata's electric vehicle venture. And I think that sets the context to this conversation in a good way to say that, you know, this is the kind of bridging the financing gap that we see in the EV space. When TPG and companies like private equity firms coming in and saying, you know, they want to bet in and give money or provide finance for the growth of the sector, it just boosts the confidence. And I think that pretty much uh, will uplift the whole sentiment around the EV space. Now, there are, of course, challenges and we we'll want to address them from each of our panelists. And I guess we already had uh, Kartik uh, give his views. We'll, of course, uh, get deeper into the conversation and get him back. But let me go to JB Sivach, who's the CEO of Kabira Mobility, uh, to get your uh, opening remarks on how you see this space, because there's absolutely no doubt that this is not going to grow. There will be growth here, but the challenge right now one is facing is the money coming into this uh, setup. So your thoughts first, your experience, and how do you see this evolve as we go? See, uh, there's no other uh, answer, madam. Electrical vehicle is the future. We accept it today or tomorrow. We have to be on one, one side of the coin that yes, tomorrow is going to be only electrical vehicles. People have some uh, double mind. Yeah, this is battery pack or this is, will not be there. Supply chain will not be there. Fund will not be there. Some that sort of challenge. This is a, every industry encounters. Like other uh, financing and other issues we are facing. Every uh, OEM has to figure at least a new entrant. And like our... Uh, the third process who accept today who go move forward with the platform and who uh, reply to the public uh, requirement today is the right choice i can tell you electrical is the uh, electrical vehicle is the immediate requirement uh, we have entered in 2017 and till date uh, in 2019 we have started in the final stage and 2020 we launched our term product in the low speeds then thereafter we see despite covid 19 Every day we find a growth. Every day we find a different, different uh, challenges are always there with the business. But we find a lot of growth, a lot of inquiries, a lot of uh, like uh, delivery vehicle. We recently launched a vehicle, uh, which is a huge demand. Like, uh, but generally we are using a petrol bike in all delivery segments and all. But I can say the entire, if you look on the industry, electrical vehicle is the future. And... Uh, as a two-wheeler, we see we cannot meet the requirement even uh, uh, every day or every year growing up. We have set up one line or two lines, something that sort of thing, meeting uh, by 20, 20, uh, 20 25,000 a month requirement. But still, we're feeling that the coming year is going to be a big challenge for us. Everybody. Okay. Okay. Fair but point. This is the big uh, subject. Okay. Uh, good. So, two points very clear. Uh, electric is the future, surely. There's no disputing that. And, uh, you know, there are, of course, uh, new models being devised, how to address the, the financing gaps. But you know what? How do you segregate between a good business and a bad business? There's no precedent set in the electric vehicle space. And, you know, I guess the, the whole challenge for a financer is to see whether, you know, he's putting the money, it will get good returns or no. Will there be acceptability or no? Uh, the, the path that one is taking to make money out of this uh, should also uh, be looked at very, very seriously because these, this is serious money being uh, put in by investors. So uh, let me come to uh, Sampath, uh, who, who looks at Tata Clean Tech Capital uh, Limited, and I'm sure you will be best positioned in that sense to tell us how do you, uh, you know, make a case for a good business and get, or, or even fund for that matter, both ways? Uh, what are some of the key ingredients that one has to look out for when you are funding for electric vehicle businesses? Because there are plenty, many, and are coming uh, as we speak on a daily basis, like growing and, and exponentially on that front. Sure, sure. Swati, I'll just make an uh, attempt on this. Uh, so basically, yes, you're right, absolutely. And, uh, you know, that's basically the theme. The EV segment is growing. Uh, it is, though, of course, one has to uh, 
um, acknowledge the fact that it's still at a fairly nascent stage and uh, with nascency there are challenges which come uh, and then, uh, you know, from a TCCL point of view, the organization that I represent, you know, we've been at the forefront of uh, financing related discussions in this space. And what I'm just going to put uh, forth here is essentially some of the experiences that we've gained as a result of these discussions. So if you ask me, you know, the, the, the key challenges or the main challenges, I would say that obviously point number one is evolving technology, the fact that, you know, the, the technology is still evolving and uh, especially under Indian conditions, uh, we still have to see, you know, how some of these initiatives, uh, you know, play up and fare up in terms of performance. Uh, the second would be the fact that, you know, as a financier, one of the things that we look for is sort of bankable structures. And one of the key underpinnings of any bankable structure is the fact that you need to have credible counterparties. And typically, uh, what we have seen uh, in the EV segment is, especially when you when it comes to the larger. Uh, facets of this, especially when you look at mass mobility segments, we actually look at, you know, the, uh, we actually dealing with counterparties, which are probably at the last leg of the government. So we are typically dealing with urban local bodies. And uh, uh, it's a well known fact that uh, the capabilities of these uh, entities are fairly weak. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not as uh, straightforward as it is given the fact that, uh, you know, the strength of the counterparties is obviously one of the key uh, key, key underpinnings for any, you know, financing proposition to happen. So mm. I think that's basically the second point. And thirdly, uh, lenders also look at uh, contracts and they look at bankable contracts. They look at contracts with steady cash flows, with a balance risk mitigation. And uh, whilst there have been efforts being made uh, at various levels to ensure that there is a fair amount of balanced uh, structure from a contract point of view, we still find that there are, uh, you know, tweaks which keep happening uh, across various regions, across various entities, and as a financier, it becomes tough for us in, in terms of dealing with multiple, uh, sure. uh, multiple tweaks okay. in these contracts. So I think that's broadly three important points. And then, of course, you know, uh, you know, as as a lender, you know, we would really love to see more. Uh, you know, of course, there is a lot of government support already, but we would love to see some more support in the initial phases of this. Uh, of this sector. Okay, sure. So great point uh, taken. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, these are very important critical points from the point of view of whoever is looking at this business seriously and is obviously looking out for funds because this is capital intensive business one is talking about. You know, the beauty of it is that everyone is, you know, betting big on this space, but uh, people are not yet very uh, sure of how to approach the finances. And I guess this is what we are trying to address. Sabin, let me come to you. Uh, what has been your company's approach the Green Climate Fund approach to fighting climate change, uh, especially focused on support to clean mobility initiatives. All right. Um, thank you so much, Swati. Um, um, I think um, I, I agree with everything that's been said so far, but I think one thing that I wanted to um, also highlight is kind of take it a little bit one step further. I mean, I think, yes, there, there is a lack of financing. That's one thing. But at the same time, when you look at the, the whole mobility space, uh, I mean, the mobility space is not something that's new. Right. So, so when you're looking at, uh, let's say, even public transport, for instance, you're not going to be basically building a new route or you're not going to be building something new. You're, you're going to be replacing that with uh, EVs. So when it comes to, uh, you know, these replacements, it, it's that, that that brings in another layer of challenges. So um, so what we're also looking at is we're not only just looking at the financing, what are the different types of financing that's needed, but also in the regulations. How do we work with governments, with municipals, with provincial governments, so that they can actually start looking at um, the, the whole space um, as a whole, and not just as you know buying a hundred buses and then you know just saying good luck, but also saying okay we're now going to buy a hundred buses and then you know how is the route planning going to happen? Who, who are going to be coming in? You know how is the replacement going to happen? Where are the the, the systems going to be? Where are the fare collections? So so those are the things that are very critical as well. And so so for for all of our projects that we look at. We just don't look at, you know, uh, how do we just buy 100 buses, but we look at, you know, we really uh, incentivize and we actually urge our, our, our partners to look at it from a holistic point of view. I think uh, Ankit mentioned this uh, in the very beginning is that we need everybody to come together. Right. Yeah. So and then I think and then for 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 the transport, it's even even it's even more critical because if you look at it in terms of all of the sectors that I've worked in, I mean, energy and the transport is the messiest when it comes to regulations, to utilization, to everything else. I mean, there are so many different ministries, municipals and everything else. And then so 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 getting all of these people to talk the same language. Good luck. 
<laughs> so, is, it, is it across the globe you see this trend, or just you're talking about India? Oh, the, 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 I mean, I, I just wish this was only one country problem, but it's it's a global problem, unfortunately. So, so this is something that we've been dealing with on on, on a regular basis. So, um, so 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 for for us uh, on the financing side, so for us on the, on our e-mobility side is also is, you know is, is it is about you know planning. How do we get the planning right, and then okay. and then based on that, how do we get you know, and then that be builds on to um, the financing. And then, you know, just the kind of, just the last point on just catch up on what uh, Sampat was saying is that, you know, yes, we need government interventions. And I think government needs to lead the way uh, okay. to catalyze financing, but it's actually going to be the private sector that's going to run this business. So, totally. so the, okay. Yeah. Okay. Point taken. And I guess uh, everyone's put uh, uh, the food for thought and brought in the right perspective, uh, set the stage into uh, further delving deeper to understanding what are probably the barriers or the challenges that we face that comes in the way of financing uh, electric vehicles. Um, Karthik, uh, of course, you did talk about uh, it briefly, but I would like you to be very specific and tell us uh, the, the way you look at this market evolve. The current, I mean, nobody's denying there's not enough opportunity, there's more than uh, plenty. But how do we address the, the constant barriers that are still in the way? There is government support that we want. I guess there are do, they are doing it, uh, their bit. I mean, we've seen the state government level, even at the central government level, the intent is clear 30% uh, uh, the electric by 2025, 20, et cetera. How do you, uh, 2030, sorry. How do you uh, see uh, those challenges being addressed as we go on? Yeah. So uh, let me unpack this into different, because there are challenges that are slightly different across the different uh, segments of the value chain. So if you look at the electric mobility value chain, starting from mining all the way to recycling and automotive product manufacturing is there in between. There is the mobility solutions piece in between. There is the infrastructure piece in between. So you have a fairly wide spectrum. And for any, uh, for, especially for a country like India, which also has a very strong manufacturing base, uh, I think the, the, it's, it's an ecosystem systemic level change that needs to happen. And the solutions, financing solutions that are needed at different sectors and, and for the different actors uh, can be somewhat different. Um, for example, mining is a very different thing from manufacturing. So you need a very different approach to looking at these uh, sectors. Having said that, I think um, broadly the, for the, the, some of the things that we are working on from a financier's perspective, start as, as we are one of the financiers. So what are the challenges that we face in this sector and how do we address those? So clearly when we look at, let's say, um, fleet applications of electric vehicles, which is the, the demand side of the story. One of the challenges for banks is that there is no resale market today. The, the residual value of electric vehicles is unknown or, or, or poorly established. Uh, so that itself creates, first of all, a very, um, strong risk aversion among in a traditional bank to try and fund an EV. So if, if the buyer is credit worthy, they'd rather bank on the buyer than on the technology. But when you're doing fleet applications, funding for fleet applications, you are needing to have to fund the revenue stream around it. If the vehicle doesn't work, then the revenue stream disappears. So you really need to know what's the, if, if there is a delinquency on a loan, how do I, at what rate do I get back that vehicle at? So that's one of the issues. And of course, the many of the players are coming in recently, the incumbents are also starting to put their vehicles together, but many of the players are young. Um, there is a, a kind of a hesitancy amongst banks. Is there a way to, how do I assess the future value of their vehicles? How is there, well, what's the support that we are going to get? So a lot of OEMs are addressing all these issues, but we kind of need to make sure that the product durability and reliability matches those kinds of um, uh, requirements of the loan tenor, for example. So again, we kind of need to work in an ecosystem approach with all the stakeholders together to make sure that these issues are addressed. So specifically, what are we doing? So one of the things, like I mentioned briefly, um, is that there is a, a joint World Bank IFC program that's going on with the uh, government of India to address some of these financing risks in a very systematic manner. So the program itself is something that uh, is not announced yet. So I can't get into the details of it, but we do expect that once that is announced, there will be a significant improvement in the ability or the willingness to look at financing of EVs uh, across different traditional financial institutions. So that is one piece that we are very actively looking at doing. On the other side, directly in, with direct interventions, we are working very actively in, in looking at the public transit sector because that gives us scale as well and has a lot of other 
positive benefits uh, in, in trans transitioning the public transit sector to electric mobility. The third piece is looking at uh, equity investments in some of the more mature, relatively more mature uh, manufacturing entities that we are there uh, that are emerging in the country today. So uh, these are some of the specific things that we are doing. Of course, we understand the, as, as Sampath mentioned, there are the risks involved, but we're trying to see from our perspective, we can do a slightly longer tenors, for example. So that's how we can be a bit more patient, uh, bring in patient capital, which is what I believe is required in a situation like this, where the industry is very nascent. How sure. do you handhold the actors in a more exactly. steady, patient manner? So these are some of the things that we are trying to do here. Interesting, very interesting trends. Uh, great inputs. Uh, 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 you know, let me come to Jabir. Uh, you know, you are yes. somebody who looks out for uh, funding and uh, you would want to maybe yeah. talk about your own experience to see when you, you know, you are out there talking to finances, trying to make them believe your business model. But, you know, for a Tata, for a Mahindra, it's just easier. Uh, but for a for a company which is relatively small and is a startup, not really ha has proven itself, uh, how difficult is it, uh, you know, to convince or get the finances attention to be able to get your funds going? I mean, your own experience, if you could share, and, and how did you ride through it? So, I will tell you, uh, we face a lot of challenges on the finance front. Because this big financial situation, they do not identify the small uh, startups and all. Even banks, uh, they do not recognize us because they are uncertain. They want a lot of warrant, guarantee and all this thing, assets and all. We do not have all this. We spend whatever the money we uh, have from left and right pocket for developing one product. We take almost a uh, two-year journey. And then uh, finally approval, it takes another one-year journey. Two, three years take for the development of product. And that needs a uh, sizable investment. And any startup have maybe from left and right, he can do four, five or ten crores. So the entire thing is... Uh, in the product. When you take this product to the banks and all, banks do not recognize the product. This IP sort of thing, this is the design and drawing. They are not identified as assets. They just take them, uh, what the property you have, what the guarantee you give. So there we find ourselves unexplained. Government don't have any policy on this type of system. And the EV we want to implement, but we do not know. I do not know. That's my opinion I'm sharing. The gap between a startup or entrepreneur who is trying to enter in the new segment is not possible, very easy, or uh, uh, path journey here is very horrible for him. Uh, he has to look on the production or products or technology implementation or has to go around the funding. Here we, we are seeing now today's uh, life, uh, we have the product ready. Uh, bikes, we have two bikes uh, approved by the government as worthy, and this we have supplied to one police departments, well accepted, high end products. But uh, to make it mass production or to industrialization of the product and uh, to deliver the mass uh, pan India networks, it needs a valuable investment and a high end teams, high end software like DMS and all those, and ERP. Sir? We are finding this huge challenge. Yes, okay, sir. great. Uh, so it's even better now we are getting to hear from uh, you to uh, the, the challenges that you are facing. And I guess it's great to be on this platform because there are people who are ready to fund provided the business model is right. So I think that working, communicating to be in the right uh, place, not necessarily just the banks, but I guess the other uh, ways to uh, look at uh, the funding going. Sir, I understand that you know you and many other entrepreneurs could be facing issues, but you know even the financer has to see the risks that he cannot, uh, you know, he has to factor in. The guarantees perhaps have to go up, et cetera. I don't know. Let's get to, uh, get on to understanding from uh, maybe Sampath. Uh, you know, you look at these businesses and they come to you almost all the time. So, you know, you have a case in point. You have somebody sitting out there who said that there is so much challenge they have to face on account of explaining their business model. How are you approaching uh, this? Because a lot of these people will have similar questions. So, Top three things that they need to qualify to be able to get money from you. Sir, you have somebody who can probably get convinced. Oh, I appreciate it. Yes, okay. Mr. Karthik, please. Is that for, is the question for me? Is that for yes, me? Sir, uh, no, 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 just go ahead. Uh, you and Karthik then, please, both of you. Okay, so uh, Karthik, would you, uh, do you want me to have first go with this? 
Yes, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Oh, thanks. Okay. All right. So, yes, Swati, I think uh, points which Javi is making very, very pertinent. I think everything goes back to the fact that, you know, sector is still evolving. One of the key issues that lenders are grappling with in this particular space is, uh, is, the, is the whole facet around performance risk. And, uh, well, I would say that, you know, this actually requires a collaborative effort amongst various, you know, stakeholders. Uh, I think from a company perspective or from an entrepreneur perspective, I mean, what lenders would like to see is an evolution of a better framework to provide warranties to cover product performance, because I think everybody agrees that, you know, that is something that is yet to be fully tested. Uh, I think Karthik also mentioned a very important point around what happens if there is a loan delinquency and what happens if, you know, uh, we've got to look at situations around, you know, resale. So yes, uh, I think a better framework around some of uh, those uh, aspects would be very, very helpful for uh, financiers. Uh, the other thing that I think I wanted to point out, and which, which also resonates with the, I think what uh, JB also said, is the fact that you know we are actually dealing with a very, very fragmented market from a player point of view in terms of the you know the 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 counterparty health and the player health. So I think this is something which I think all lenders who are trying to make an inroad in, into the space is the problem that we face. And this is something actually that requires a solution at a more macro level from a financing ecosystem point of view. I'm not just saying from a EV ecosystem point of view, I'm saying from a financing ecosystem point of view. And I'm sure, you know, Karthik can touch upon it, you know, when he yes. speaks. Uh, yes. And one last thing is, you know, from a financier point of view, uh, you know, people also, I think some someone spoke about the loan tenors and extension of the loan tenors. And I would say that, you know, uh, the extension of the loan tenors can happen, will happen, subject to the fact that the underlying contract tenors also kind of at least match up with the loan tenors. End of the day, and in just to conclude, it's ultimately needs to be seen as a partnership until I think the evolution of the space happens. You know, there would be various aspects, you know, uh, which may not mat match up to everybody's expectation, but I think that's part of the nascent market. And I think all of us should need, you know, need to need to make efforts on a collaborative basis to see how we can take it to the next level. Okay, collaboration. Uh, Karthik, please. So um, I think that the the points that men, that were mentioned by Mr. Javier are, are very valid, and I feel the pain. I, I understand. I've seen uh, how mm -hmm. difficult it is for early stage uh, product companies in India, in particular, to uh, to attract uh, the relevant kind of financing. So in general, automotive is an industry which is capex heavy and long gestation. So it takes a while to develop your product, get it to the market. It, requires a couple of years or three years, even more. So uh, to have that kind of a, uh, a patient capital available at a very seed stage, when you are just probably just with an idea and, and you have to take a full product development process through, requires a, a pretty significant kind of risk-taking ability. Development finance institutions like ours are generally not able to do that because we come in at a, at a later growth stage kind of investment. So what's the what's the what's the opportunity? So I think this one is a real challenge. Today, what I have seen in the in the Indian industry from the several the few entrepreneurs that I have um, engaged with, interacted with, some of them have been able to um, raise funds from VCs abroad, where there is a greater appetite to look at the risk. There is a greater willingness to accept that the size of the market in India allows space for many players to coexist. And therefore, there is a potential opportunity to back a good entrepreneur in, in a product space as well. So I would say that that's one, sec one space through which financing has been happening. There are a couple of Indian VCs also who are seed stage or early stage investors who have been providing financing for this uh, product uh, space uh, startups. Uh, but once you kind of cross the hill, I think that's when uh, development finance institutions can definitely play a role. We do invest in manufacturing. Sure. Um, companies and, and can bring in the required capital to scale it up. Okay, great. Uh, some of the key inputs to be, uh, you know, heard. Uh, Sabin, uh, since you also obviously have a big fund, which focuses on green climate, and you know, there's far many been announced by many companies, many corporates, uh, not just in India, all across the globe. So while there are quite a few, there's only very few that, uh, you know, kind of um, are approachable in that sense, or materializes for most uh, entrepreneurs. So there is, uh, there are funds, people willing to invest, but uh, there are challenges, you know, it's a very beautiful combination. Tell us uh, your thoughts on what uh, JB just talked about. And I guess this is the story of all entrepreneurs. Um, yeah, and 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 with Karthik, I mean, I, I I do feel the pain as well because I mean, um, 
I, I've been on that side of the, the, the table myself. So uh, I know exactly what you're going to do here as well. So um, for that, uh, yeah. Uh, but I mean, I think this is this is where I think, you know, uh, funds like ourselves uh, and the Green Climate Fund and then even with IFC and, and, and clean, uh, Tata Clean Tech, this is where I think we kind of come in um, to really kind of, you know, put in a, a risk premium uh, on how we finance, right? So I think, um, like like Jamie said, I mean, I think there, there there are a couple of issues. I mean, there are issues on you know technology performance. There are issues on you know uh, repayment risk or 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 even financing risk that are there from from a uh, from an entrepreneur's point of view. But at the same time, uh, what what also needs to happen is to really kind of see how do we work on de-risking uh, all of these things. I mean, so and the de-risking the, the becomes actually much more important than just providing um, you know cheap capital. Right, I think, uh, and then if, if you look at the global market, and this also includes India as well, I mean, we, there's lots of studies been done on that, uh, just providing cheap capital, I mean, it, it's fantastic, I mean, you, you, you get very cheap capital, but, but after that, that cheap capital is done, then what? Right. So, so, so therefore, I mean, when you're, you know, that's one of the things that we're really looking at is how, how do we work with funds uh, uh, like, you know, uh, um, with clean tech, uh, Tata clean tech, or even the IFC or the World Bank is to really kind of say, but how do we bring in those de-risking instruments uh, into play? Um, so, uh, and, and, and that, that is, that is the, the, the key thing. So, um, so just to give you an example, I mean, so, so for, from a, from a, uh, you know, entering into a market perspective, I mean, one of the projects that we financed, uh, was uh, a BRT in, in Karachi. Uh, so in the BRT system, so I mean, the Karachi has an informal public sector uh, transport system. And then this was a brand new, you know, uh, BRT system that was set up. But, you know, this is coming into, you know, then you need the private sector guys to actually start operating it. So they will not buy these new buses, for sure. I mean, they already have their old buses that they already have. So the, what we did was we really restructured everything so that we basically, you know, came up with a you know, whole, you know, total cost of ownership of the new buses. And then and and laid out a whole leasing plan on top of that. So therefore, people would you know uh, come in with their old buses, get a new bus, and then there was a whole long you know financial lease, which is actually about 15 year lease um, built into the program. So that therefore you know these people that actually needed the buses or the bus operators, instead of spending capital uh, in terms of you know buying new buses, they we converted the capital uh, capex into opex which was much more easier for them to kind of uh, digest and handle and then and built on that. So, so, so okay. you, we need to kind of look at slice and dice this up. I mean, everybody talks about capital, you know, and, and CapEx, but then is there, if, is there an opportunity to convert a, a, you know, a CapEx into OpEx? And then, then an OpEx is in more in control of the entrepreneur than a CapEx. So, 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 I mean, you know, these are a couple of things that, you know, we, we try to <laughs> deal with on a daily basis as well. Okay, great. You know what? I'm starting to see a lot of questions coming in, pretty interesting ones. So I probably will uh, soon get on to that because that will help uh, engage better with people who have tried to ask questions. And because we have to stop at 1.30, we'll try and incorporate as many. Uh, Karthik, very quickly, um, you know, when it comes to financing the electric vehicle domain and since every each of the uh, vertical is evolving, I mean, you talk about the two-wheelers, uh, three-wheelers, uh, cars and buses and public transport and so on. Which amongst these do you think will kick off first? And as a part of uh, your financing plans or your teams, what is it that you think is most lucrative to you know kind of start uh, with? I mean, what attracts you more amongst this vertical? I mean, just to get a sense on your thoughts. With a two-wheeler entrepreneur on the panel, I can't say no to two-wheelers. Right? So. Uh, yeah, so I think no. To be to be fair, uh, I think definitely the two and three wheeler space is uh, really uh, showing signs of very rapid growth. Um, year on year, it's been it's, it's showing very rapid growth, and we do believe that there is a, a very solid economic case why that's happening. So we feel that that's definitely going to be a sector that's going to be um, taking off first. Uh, buses are something the government is very keen on, um, and uh, they have a very strong policy to promote that. Uh, so I believe that the, the bus sector would continue to grow, uh, public transit, um, the focus has been on intracity, but I'm again seeing a lot of interest coming in into the intercity space as well. So I think buses is another sector because you do a lot of kilometers every day and that plays well with the, uh, the advantages of an EV. So uh, buses is another sector that through the government support is starting to uh, see uh, good, good growth. Passenger cars, I think it's, it'll, it'll probably passenger cars and four-wheeler LCVs in particular would start of come a bit later. But again, uh, I think um, a lot of interest. 
I'm I'm very happy to see that uh, in the passenger car segment, even with uh, personal mobility, there is a lot of uh, interest that has been uh, coming in, and there's been a, the rate of growth has been very significant in terms of absolute numbers. It's not um, a very large number, but I think the rate of growth is very encouraging to see that. So those are my thoughts on on the growth of the sector in India. Thank you. Sure, uh, but you know, I just want one thought from uh, just out of curiosity. Is there a number that you guys work on and say, you know, this is the kind of investments that you made, and this is the gap that's still there, and you would like to look out for companies, or is it very discrete and project based, and only if it makes sense you would like to hire? I mean, just just the uh, thought behind uh, investing in in a in a greener setup. Uh, how IFC approaches it? Sure. So it is a mix. So there is definitely a sector consideration that comes in, but then we are not uh, we are not averse. For example, IFC's first investment in the EV space in India was in 2018 in a company called Lithium Urban Technologies, which uses passenger cars for uh, corporate employee transport. So it was actually four wheelers where we first invested in India in the EV sector. So it's it's not necessarily tied to one or the other. We definitely look at the sector. But uh, we are also very cognizant about what kind of a company we are investing in. So it, it's okay. a mix of things. Okay. Sampath, uh, you would want to come in and tell us what your uh, thoughts are for, for your company, what has been the investment so far, and where is it that you're looking to further uh, invest? Is there something that people should look out for? Uh, yes, yes, uh, Swati. So what we have done from a TCCL point of view is that you know we have been evaluating a fair number of opportunities. Uh, uh, what I would say is that from a segment perspective, yes, I mean, the, the two-wheeler and the three-wheeler segments are more headline-grabbing, if I may call it that way. But really, uh, what I would say is that, you know, from a from an overall, uh, uh, from an overall uh, impact point of view, I think it's probably the mass mobility segment, which could really make the difference in terms of you know, combating the, you know, the, 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 sort of the sort of the perils of climate change, if you want to call it that way. And to that, you know, we have seen a fair amount of activity happening actually in the e-buses segment under the GCC contracts, uh, you know, that have come uh, into play and the number of cities now, which have, which are basically running now e-buses under the GCC contracts. So what we have done is we've actually funded one such, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, one such opportunity, which was basically a, uh, financing that we did for a large group, which basically supplied buses to uh, basically the Ahmedabad Municipal Corporation. They are currently uh, running these buses. So to that extent, it's been a very, very successful uh, experiment. It's one of the first. So we've been one of the pioneers in this space to that extent. Okay. All right. So that's the kind of investments that you've done so far. Um, let me come to Sabine. Uh, you know, the ideal case for you to look at and say, oh, you know, this is the perfect business model and i'd like to finance this what is that i mean how do you how how do you make that demarcation what are the to do's in that list um, yeah so for, for for us i mean uh from our strategy our investment strategy in in low emission transport uh, is really about um uh, is about uh, you know climate change so i mean when you look at the whole uh, you know mobility space the, the best way to actually achieve high impact on climate change is through model shift. So that's basically, you know, taking people away from, you know, private cars to public transport. So therefore we do, we promote public transport as much as possible. So if, if we see a good public transport project where, you know, you're really looking at uh, moving people away from cars to buses and then, to, and then, and that it too, uh, to, to uh, electric buses, that, that is kind of like a, a, a sweet spot for us. And then, like I said before, I mean, and then if that, you know, number of buses uh, is also coupled with, you know, uh, uh, transport planning or transport uh, regulations or on, on our private sector uh, finance on institutional development so that, you know, there is, uh, you know, some uh, longevity in terms of sustainability of the product, then that, that that's our holy grail is where we can actually really look at, you know, a good uh, uh, tra public transport project with regulations and, and, and planning built in so that, you know, you we're, we're kind of doing everything together. Okay. Uh, how know. much fundings have uh, come in from Green Climate Fund into Indian setups? Uh, so, so for India, I mean, so globally right now, we have financed um, two large projects. So uh, we have a $50 million project in Pakistan, uh, in Karachi, like I said, and then we just recently approved uh, a $200 um, $270 million uh, light rain project in, um, in Costa Rica. 
But, okay, so India, uh, India is the next market probably. Uh, in, India, the, I mean, so I, I can't, I mean, like Kartik, we are working on a project in India, which is which is nice. very big. Uh, and and, and, and it, it's very innovative as well. I think, I mean, Fantastic. I'm really excited about it, uh, but since it's still in the progress, I can't, but I, was, I wish no I problem. could. Of course, of course. <laughs> no, just but, to see the kind of interest that India throws for funds like yours and the opportunity, uh, it's heartening to see there is enough and more uh, interest uh, and, and, you know, intent uh, more than anything. Uh, Jabir, uh, you've heard everybody who's ready to, you know, they have funds, they're ready to put in. The business case has to make sense and it should just fit the uh, purpose for what, for what this fund has been uh, created. Tell us, uh, for your next growth, uh, Philip, an opportunity, you said you have a couple of products. I'm sure you have like a big, big plan over a period of time to grow because this space is growing exponentially. Also, there's so much more competition. So how do you distinct yourself to the others and say, you know, you are the best amongst others. Because, you know, if I'm a financer, I'll say, you know, I have five other people and they're already telling me that they're doing very well. What is it that you bring to the table, which is so attractive that I should fund you? You know, I'm sure you are bombarded with question all the time. So how do you respond to that? Yes. So I'll tell you the electrical vehicle, uh, you asked me that before that uh, I was not uh, Electrical vehicle, two-wheeler will play the bigger role, in my opinion. Yes, auto rickshaw, the three-wheeler and all doing good job, but uh, two-wheeler is the biggest uh, economic because upfront, everyone who is paying, uh, like everyone office over and all, they spend a lot of money, around 200, 300 rupees per day. So that is a big pain to them. The petrol prices are going every day high. And people are getting educated towards the climate change also. And they are also feeling the impacts. So people, the new generation is accepting the change. So two-wheeler is the first segment, which is with a low cost, a big impact can be felt by everywhere. Now about us, we have uh, high-end products to high-speed bikes, which are uh, not available of that level anywhere in India. And uh, we have one delivery vehicle, which is the biggest change also because presently our delivery segment is being delivered by a uh, personal two-wheeler. And that is also mostly petrol two-wheelers. That need a precise delivery vehicle, and we have the delivery segment, a special bike that is electrical vehicle. Another than we have two high-speed uh, smart scooters, like uh, any other people have, at the end, those things, this will be coming to the market in December. So we have five products of high speed. In addition, we have some low speed that is uh, going to be uh, team out out of the production now. That is only for the coolest segment we kept it and last mile connectivity. So this is our uh, sizable range. We have sizable uh, investment also done. We have two setup. One is a one production line at Goa. Second production line which can produce around 40,000 vehicle is almost ready and November trial and uh, trial production will start from November onward at Darbar plant. So this is what, but now uh, making 100 or uh, 500 vehicle is a small capital, but uh, when we need 1,000 and 5,000 vehicle, we can see the cost of it's uh, around uh, raw material uh, is around, we can say around 80,000 to one leg, so it is around 80 crores and 100 crores sort of thing. So big subject. Uh, we certainly need the cooperation from our people, uh, the persons who are around here okay. with the funding okay. people. So they need okay. certainly uh, take care of the, we may not be sound enough today in many documentation. I can tell you straightforward, but we need to be identified. If the products are work, platform is work, and that meet the requirement of the public. So let the public decide that. And Sir, okay, uh, not our capabilities. Right. Okay, okay. All right. Of course, the product will right, speak for itself, as you said. And I guess that's very, very, that's the proof uh, of pudding is in eating, as we know. Uh, Karthik, um, and in fact, a question for all uh, the panelists, very quickly, your thoughts and perspective on the 3S model uh, for, for EVs. And, you know, we typically see that for passenger vehicles, uh, sales, service, and spares. Now, does, do you guys give enough consideration on that uh, aspect to uh, especially uh, do OEMs have financing support to enable this in an effective manner? Short answer is yes from my perspective. If we are looking at if I investing into an OEM, we very strongly look at what is their model for uh, sales and service and spare support. Uh, if we are looking at a fleet uh, operation which is going to be funded, of course the, the entire OEM support in terms of warranties, spare support, training, uh, service center support, all of these aspects are very closely looked into. Definitely, yes. Sabin? 
Yes, I mean, and that, that, I think that that's the the, the 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 one part I forgot to mention when when you were asking the last question is exactly the three S model. Because I mean, you know, like I talked about the the both of our uh, projects that we financed, uh, the the critical piece has always been on the O and M and the spares uh, that have come in, so that you know, because um, like I said, the TCO model uh, that we used for uh, BRT Karachi is all built around the the the, the O and M. So, so the, the after sale service and everything else is built into the leasing agreement already. So it's, it's actually factored in for the first five years. So, uh, so therefore, you know, uh, even, you know, if the, the, the bus owners don't want to actually make use of it, they're already paying for it. So therefore, you know, we, we want to make sure that TPM is, you know, um, is, is, is part and parcel of their operation. So that, you know, it, it, uh, as for, as you know, for, from habit from forming point of view, you know, if you can get someone to do something for at least three years in a row, then that forms a habit so the you know so getting the, the 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 sales and services actually really looked into as part of the project that basically you know makes the longevity of the buses as well as the whole route um, sustainable as well and, and that's what we're looking for and, and that's always part of the project okay yeah uh, sampath you uh, concur with uh, what been said any additional points uh no i think uh, i think at the beginning i think okay. Karthik had uh, summed it up you know so Sure. Uh, okay, I, I'll start taking the questions also from the audience because there are far too many and I guess we are already like closer to, uh, you know, we won't even realize when it will be 130. So let me get Farooq Sheikh's question. I think it's a very interesting question from the point of India in, the, in that context because we are uh, looking at financing for low speed electric scooters because they are plenty in number right now and there's not much financial support at this point in time because there's no license there. Uh, banks, NBFCs are obviously reluctant. Uh, but this is actually used by a lot of common people, students, housewives, senior citizens, you know, that sensitive uh, age group we are talking. How can we work around a better financing option for that category? Any thoughts, Karthik, that, uh, you know, we can come up with a plan? And, and as you said, collaboration is the key. But, but exactly how can we work around it, if you could give your thoughts? Yeah. So there are... Um... Really, this is actually a space in which NBFCs have been playing a large role. I'm, I'm not referring to Tata Cleantech here, but a host of other NBFCs has actually been uh, involved in, in the, in the low-speed uh, vehicle finance case. The challenge is the, the rate of interest that they charge. It's 24% plus, and that's uh, killing, right? So I think that's the challenge. And, and where does the challenge come from? Partly, of course, the NBFC model is, is that they, they typically have higher interest rates. But also, again, coming back to the point or the, the earlier point around the fact that many of these manufacturers are small scale, they are just coming in into the market, there is no pedigree or heritage of around them, so therefore those challenges come in. So uh, I think the, the point is that broadly, the, the earlier point that I mentioned that we are working with the government to look at how do we kind of de-risk the sector as a whole would hopefully bring in that kind of a financial structure to all categories of vehicles, including the low speed ones. We are not distinguishing across them. We are very cognizant that this is a, the low speed vehicles are relevant for uh, a very large population and therefore we do need to address that. So hopefully some of these financial um, structures that we would bring in would address those challenges. Okay, Sampath, you want to add on to this? I think Sampath has some connectivity issues. Okay, Sabin. <clears throat> yeah, no, I mean, I, think I, I fully agree with Karthik on this. I think it, it, this is about de-risking. Uh, I mean, you know, like I said, I mean, I think even from the GCF side, I mean, though we provide a, a whole lot of concessional capital uh, into the space. Uh, but again, given that, you know, we're also looking for impact that also balances um, the, 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 the capital that we put in, um, it, you know, we, we really need to kind of figure out uh, what, what is the, the biggest bang for our buck as well in terms of, you know, the climate numbers versus, you know, uh, what's the impact that's going to be met. So, so we're, we're, we're looking at models right now. I mean, I think the, and then the key thing for us really when we're looking at, you know, two wheelers and three wheelers is, is really about um, uh, building an ecosystem around uh, public transport. Right. So, so when you're, you know, one of the key things uh, that comes up is when you look at public transport is that you're, you're, you're looking at vertebrae. And then once, uh, you know, if you have a BRT line, that's a vertebrae, and then, but you also need the last mile connectivity. Then, you know, this is where your two wheelers and three wheelers that are electric actually become a pivotal role. So if you can create a business model around that, then, then all of a sudden, you know, then, then you're, you're going to start, you know, um, getting more utility out of, uh, these um, smaller units. So, so, so we're, we're trying to uh, trying to you know build that into a, into a larger picture as well. 
So uh, again, I mean, this is the, the, the one of the issues that we're actually uh, dealing with in the, the Costa Rica project uh, is, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge light rain, 83 kilometers of light rain, but then it also has, you know, uh, small uh, little pockets where you know, you're, you're looking at three wheel EVs that are actually going to be servicing the people from their homes to the stations. So I think, okay. you know, so you need to kind of, you know, I think it's, it's not a, a one shot deal, but it's, it's, it's a combination of different things. Okay, combination of different things all have to be taken into consideration. Yes, uh, yeah. Jaybir, uh, do you think that the government here has to play some uh, role uh, in terms of making maybe uh, this particular space a priority sector lending, EV financing under priority sector lending? Do you think this will help? And do you think it has enough uh, potential to be heard? Uh, is the government yeah. keen on this? Any forums that you've represented that? Uh, I will tell you, uh, Swati, this one. First thing is our uh, that's financing uh, uh, system or our banking or our private financing. They are looking basically the approved system. What is approved? This electrical vehicle is not approved segment yet, not accepted yet. So there is a big challenge to identify this, how to do this and all the things. They are just trying and testing. The other bank has done, then we cannot take a risk. So it is something uh, to do first. In the, there should be some policy and government to prioritize that. That is no place and all this private uh, even uh, financing or NBFC and all those things, they take some more advantage, take more uh, interest there and that is the final burden to the individual user, end user. So there's a big challenge and we must answer this because electrical vehicle segment need to be accepted now. Sure, okay. Today, okay. Second, I'll say about the government policies. Government okay. policies, uh, there should be uh, a straightforward uh, policies helping the electrical vehicle manufacturer. Like subsidy came to subsidies available, but it, that is given to the customer and directed from the supply chain. Because even the vehicle is sold later, but we have to give the subsidy in advance. So something that subsidy for the setting up, why someone will set up the thing? Why someone will invest okay. there? So sure. It has okay. to be prioritized for the uh, OEM to set up the supply chain and set up the factories, invest in the sizable things over there. Okay. So those two things and a commonization in policy. Like if I have a charger, that should be very uh, uniform battery pack, which can be swappable to other brands also. So that this should be commonization system should be all Okay, sure. So a lot of inputs, lot of inputs for the government. In fact, the, uh, there are a couple of questions which were on the lines. Uh, Gina Kadam has right. this on the government's uh, initiatives and also Srijit B did talk about the priority sector lending status to EV financing. All right. Uh, one question from Ashok uh, Krishnamurti. Uh, he says, uh, keeping aside the benefits of the environment, financially speaking, be uh, because of the huge replacement cost of EV batteries, are EVs actually losing its sheen? Uh, Karthik? Um. I think there's a lot of uh, points here that, first of all, uh, is there a huge replacement cost? Yes and no, because on the one hand, battery prices are declining and hopefully they will continue to do so. And that will be nice for everyone. Uh, but on the other hand, OEMs do price spare parts pretty aggressively. So um, typically what you go and when you do a service of your car, even a regular car, Dealers make a lot of money through spare parts. Yes, that's a given. And then you have a part which is 30% of the cost of the vehicle or 40%. Double that up. Why not with a huge markup? You have nowhere to go. Sure. So it's going to hit you really hard, right? So I think there is a little bit of that that might play out. I'm not, I'm not saying it is playing out. I don't know what, uh, what different OEMs are, how different OEMs are pricing their replacement battery prices. But over time, I think this is something that would need to be addressed, that there is no... Uh, inordinate monopolistic pricing that comes in into this space. But having said that, overall, I believe, uh, again, I, I can't answer this question uh, in, a, in a very uh, predictive manner, yeah, but yeah, my sure. viewpoint it's is that, the, yeah. sure, my viewpoint is that I think this is something that if, if, if the prices become so high that, I mean, because of OEM markups being so large that it starts to hit the sector, that would not be in the OEM's interests themselves, number one. And number two, I think somewhere there would be some kind of a policy viewpoint that will be taken upon this. So I'm overall optimistic that there would be, of course, a markup that OEMs would charge on a replacement battery. 
but it would not be so bad as to hit themselves on their own foot. So it will hopefully stabilize in that manner. Okay, I think, yeah, it is work in progress and there's so many elements that are coming together. So sure, uh, these are some of the points one has to keep in mind, no doubt. Uh, similar kind of questions are coming, but let's address them. Jaya Jain has written that, you know, lithium ion contains hazardous materials and one needs to be careful while dismantling, etc. Safety, of course, becomes a very critical part of this. Now, financing for recycling, sustainable discarding of batteries, is that being considered? Because that's a very, very important part of this entire value chain. Uh, or uh, uh, and and or what are the ways to make EV batteries more sustainable? I'll, I'll ask uh, Sabine to come on in. Yeah, no, I mean I think that the, exactly. I mean I think the the recycling becomes a big issue. Now, having said that, I think this is this is where the, the battery value chains as well, and then I think we need to kind of step away from the uh, just from the transport, then then go into the more uh, the, the energy systems, right? So I mean if you if you're looking at now the the, the infiltration of renewable energy and then you know all of these variable load energy systems, one of the key things that's coming up in the energy system is about storage. Um, and then so that's a lot of with battery storage. So I think what, what uh, we're looking at as well as well as the sector is looking at is given that, you know, EV batteries are discharged very fast. So they you know, they have a life of let's say seven years or eight years or now, now it's about 12 years now. But when, when that's being replaced, they still have a really good value life. In the in the energy systems, so when you're looking at energy storage, you know that they're, they're they still will be having another productive life of another 10, 15 years uh, in that system as well. So so that you know you can basically move that battery which would have been recycled after 12 years. Now you can actually give it another seven to eight years in in the energy systems as well. So I think that that's one way of adding value to the battery. And then afterwards, that that's when you can uh, look, look at the whole uh, recycling chain. So, so I think you know th this is where you know where the, the whole uh, system as a whole, not just uh, the transport, but the whole you know I guess the renewable and the climate systems are really trying to basically talk to one another. You know what's good good coming out of one can be used in the other as well. So I mean I think and, and then that goes vice versa for uh, the the uh, the charging uh, stations and everything else. So so I mean it, it, it's becoming a collective. Uh, um, uh, arrangement that that's that's that, that we're slowly seeing okay. because I mean these and used to be separate things now they're actually coming together. Integral part of the whole value chain, and you recognize that as a financer. Uh, there is a question from uh, Akshay Abi. He's asking, actually, uh, yeah, a couple of them. Rural EV market segment on the radar. Does that excite you guys? Uh, because there's a potential market for two wheelers and commercial goods carrier four wheelers. So. Is that more exciting than the traditional uh, bit? Uh, both of you, Karthik and Sabine, maybe. And then I'll, of course, come to JB on a specific question. Sabine, okay. go first, please. All right. So, yeah, from our side right now, uh, at least for GCF1, which is up till um, 2023, uh, we're really focused on the urban side of things. So really trying to see how we can basically work the urban side uh, as much as possible. And that's really about, you know, like I said, public transport and the shared shared systems and everything else. Uh, but at the same time, we're also looking at, um, you know, um, um, delivery vehicles within the within the cities I mean, for, 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 for the Amazon fleets, for the Lazada fleets and all of these guys who, who are actually, you know, using smaller uh, vehicles. And, and, and those smaller vehicles are actually being also used in rural systems as well. So I think you know that, that there's a little bit of a move from urban to rural on that space. Uh, but I think uh, as we go along, I think from 2024 onwards, I think uh, we're going to be looking at more into freight transport as well. So um, so I think that'll be much more a priority okay, for that's, GCF. That's also on the radar, surely. Okay, yeah. No, I agree. I think basically we are, we are not very uh, focused on uh, rural versus urban kind of a sector specific approach. We are looking at it at a more holistic level. Um, but not because of us, but I think a lot of the uh, activity today is focused on the uh, urban, the intra-urban kind of a sector, which is where therefore the opportunities are also coming in, where the rural markets are a little bit more, even more nascent and therefore smaller scale uh, relative to what's happening in the urban sectors right now. I just wanted to also, if, if I can take a minute to, uh, to the point about the recycling bit, I just yes, wanted to please, add a couple of points yes. to, I think the point about reuse is an important uh, aspect to consider in the whole value chain. I also want to point out that it's very interesting that in India, there is a lot of recycling that happens. It's semi-formal or informal, not very organized. There are a couple of organized players who are starting to come in into the space. But I think it's important to keep in mind that lithium-ion batteries are not something of a novelty. 
you have used recycler lithium ion batteries coming in from laptops, cell phones, and the like. And there is a very large semi-organized informal, not very organized sector that has been already doing a lot of uh, the collection and recycling of some of these batteries. Uh, now that's starting to get uh, ramped up, but again, the business case in many cases is not very good. And therefore we are also working to, to en en uh, encourage a policy that ensures there is a, a proper collection of used batteries from electric vehicles and other energy storage uh, sectors and a recycling industry is also created locally. So that is initiatives that we are taking to work on that space as well. Thank you. Okay, sure. Uh, Jabir, uh, there's a question which I think you could be best fit to respond to. Harish Taneja sent, uh, what, are yours, uh, what is your outlook on the electricity consumption by EVs, uh, considering the load it will put on the grids and views on deficit of coal production that we are seeing at this stage? Uh, of course, it's a very topical issue right now, but do you think it will directly or indirectly impact EV production in some way? The power supply will not impact the EV segments because mostly do not, uh, it's not a more power consumption organization. It is just need a freezer like normal charge. And that solar system can sustain that, I believe. That is how our all units are equipped with the solar system. So that is what I feel. But in national wise, I will not be able to answer correctly. But it don't need a power as even uh, like normal freeze is required uh, to be charged like that. Maybe two units or five units for one charge. Two units for normal battery of okay. around uh, 60 volts. And okay. if 72 volts and 45 volts, maybe five units or four units, nothing more. Okay. Sure. Uh, very interesting question from Dev Arora. Just got, uh, he's the co founder of Alt Mobility. It's an EV leasing company focusing on offering operational lease for LCV logistic companies. Uh, that space, obviously, we're seeing a lot of traction of electric vehicles, uh, um, drivers and fleet operators in intra-city transport. Now, um, he wants to basically hear your thoughts, Karthik and Sabins, on the long-term evolution of operational lease model vis-a-vis -vis any future EV finance solutions offered conventional lenders uh, or by NBFCs. Karthik, you want to go first and then I'll go to Sabin. No, I think this is a very interesting um, uh, um, financing model. Operational leases are something that is uh, very keenly being looked at across the e-mobility sector. Um, this is happening in a large scale in the public transit space in e-buses. And there's a lot of interest to look at something along these lines for smaller form factor vehicles as well. So I think um, in summary, the, the point that uh, Mr. Dave is mentioning is very valid. I think there is a, definitely a, a, a potential in something like this. Okay. Sabin? Um, yeah, I, I would have to agree with Karthik on that. I mean, we actually got uh, a concept note uh, for operational lease model uh, in, um, in Southern Africa. Um, can't say the country right now, but I mean, uh, but I mean, I think, you know, it, it, it's a really uh, innovative model. Man. And I think, you know, given that uh, a lot of the, 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 the issues that we were seeing as well, I mean, like I said, I mean, you know, it, it's about moving CapEx to OpEx. And I think this is, this is where this really comes in is, is really about this. So I then I mean, yeah, I think that this could be a really good market and then a, a good model to be coming up. And I think it need, uh, if, if it can be done right, uh, I think it could be a game changer from my point of view. Uh, but that, that's a personal opinion. <laughs> Okay. All right. So this uh, looks promising. Evolving. Yes, please go ahead, JP. Yes. Okay. I just want to add on. I got many similar proposal and both because of the funding, they all got pressed out. From India, I got uh, different uh, from Delhi, from Hyderabad. They were similar project and uh, most of them because of the fund, they were facing a big challenge. So I don't know about the worldwide, but India, yes, people are facing fewer problems. Banking is not recognized now. Financing okay. is a big challenge here. And implementing becomes so difficult. We, we are trying to address yes. that point through this forum. And I guess the, this is going to be the talking point as at many other forums in EV space. Surely they've recognized this is a challenge and we need to find this. This is a big challenge. That is what I'm also trying to say, Swati, because this yes. is uh, people are facing downline. Uh, uh, really, they prepared everything, the project, uh, they have implemented most of the, some cases maybe uh, 50 or uh, 100 vehicles, then thereafter they could not be sustaining because there was further funding was not possible with that. Mm -hmm. so. Karthik, do you agree? I, I think he's a, he has a fair point. Do you think there is 
not many forums uh, or may, maybe a database that can probably be given to such entrepreneurs to see you know there are enough money been kept aside for good businesses uh, there are people who want to finance it but you know at the same time we are seeing a lot of people not getting that uh, maybe because of lack of uh, awareness about so many companies and funds coming together so do you think a database of a sort a collectively across, i mean technology can be leveraged on this uh, do you agree and uh, is there a potential on that because it's a global phenomena so yes i think one part of it where if you are talking about building a database which enables entrepreneurs to reach out to different entities to explore financing options uh, having that consolidated i think that would definitely be of a, of use and value to the entrepreneurs i agree on that point uh over and about that i think there are the other challenges that we have i think clearly this the 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 nascency of the market and therefore a lot of the players being out of at a very uh, early stage creates a bit of a challenge because there is a lot of the large scale funding like development finance entities coming in which typically finance later stage projects and you really need financing to bridge this gap of early stage funding and that's where i think there is a gap i do agree on that there is a gap but you know at least we are recognizing it we are trying to work around yeah. it good businesses will uh, give be given attention and i'm sure there are a lot of forums like these that uh, you know since it's picking up it's an evolving uh, yes. setup so i guess mr uh, jb you don't have to be uh, disappointed there are uh, at least conversations starting there is a Yes. People can need to be brought to the table. That is more important from our side. I guess the database bit should be an interesting point. I think yeah. that should help because logo ko dena bhi hai ready to fund and there are enough takers. So you know it will be a nice uh, combination. Anyway, uh, quickly uh, there is one three three C challenges uh, Ashay has sent uh, capacity capacity capital and commercialization in the EV sector. Wow, a very big question. how can that be resolved do we have one any one answer for this well sabin you want to try responding to it um, yeah no i mean i think um, <laughs> it's a huge thing and then uh, i mean i think the, the only thing that i see um, i mean i guess one line answer is i think we need to to get um, uh, i go back to the first thing that i think ankit also says we just need to get everybody together I mean, this is it's it, it's uh, it's about looking at things from a different perspective, and I think just kind of go back to JP's uh, his question as well a little bit is, um, you know, one thing about the EV markets is, I mean, it, we're talking about transport, but I mean, since it's we're kind of uh, disrupting the market as it is, we need to really kind of you know uh, go away from what was financed, how it was financed before. I mean, uh, car financing from banks versus you know all of these, which were much more easy to be, to be done. and then now going into evs is totally different so i think you know this is where uh, you know uh, the, and i i try to always equate uh, evs to energy efficiency because you know it's it, we're now looking at the same challenges in in the evs that we've seen in energy efficiency for the last 20 years so uh, and the people in transport are just kind of getting into the, like oh geez this is difficult now right so so i think that this is where i think we we need to kind of merge different sectors together and then kind of say okay what's worked in one sector and how do we bring it together uh, and then and then having said that i think this is uh, for for me the EV EV market right now stands at where uh, solar PVs were 20 years ago. So I mean we're we're starting this off, you know, we're and then so we need to kind of you know learn uh, how that picked up and then basically you know shave the time off by 10 years, 15 years, and then yes, you know, then I think that's, <laughs> that's the okay, way. great, good point. So sir, uh, I hope uh, we at least all of us are on the same page to realize that this is the same. Uh, market like a pv market which of course had its teething issues initially and eventually took off this one will be much faster take off with you know the potential exponential rise we are seeing in adoption of it uh, also with the clean energy uh, theme on around it jina kadam has asked a question i did i think uh, but you know it's a specific question of government initiatives being given support by way of first credit guarantees for these small entrepreneurs especially since ev are so critical today uh your thoughts you think this should happen um kartik so um i assume what uh, this question is is it referring to a first loss guarantee of some kind and yeah got to interpret it in that way and and answer this i think at an equity finance level this is not something that equity takes the risk either it either a project works or it doesn't so there, there is no like a loss guarantee that you can provide on on uh, equity on debt finance yes there is something that um, can definitely be looked at 
and this is something we are cognizant of. We are trying to address that. Uh, Sabin, you want to respond? Maybe your your uh, your inputs from other markets. Uh, how you see that happen in some of the other parts of the world? Sabin, you are on mute. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I agree with Karthik on this. I mean, when you're looking at debt financing, a first loss vehicle um, uh, really would incentivize the you know the commercial banks to kind of you know uh, look at financing this a little bit better. And I think that and then the key thing for from what I see on debt financing that we've seen in, uh, when we worked with debt financing, even here at the GCF or when I was at IFC was you know it's, it's not about you know providing uh, the money, but it's it's about getting the institutions to be more comfortable in really assessing the market as a you know as, as a potential market and then you know once we can get uh, commercial financiers to understand that oh yeah we can this this does really work then you know i think that then you you get the the commercial financing much more uh, readily happening okay all right uh, wonderful uh, kartik sabine and uh, jabir i guess we'll have to uh, conclude this session but very interesting points that have been raised by each of you uh, in the um, you know uh, in the interest of people who are looking at uh, financing opportunities, also uh, people who would like to avail it. So uh, for both, there is enough uh, that's being done, but you know, with the constant evolution of the space, the challenges that one is facing, there's a lot of streamlining that one needs to see happen. Uh, thank you for your inputs. I guess uh, this will be beneficial for people who are looking uh, to get uh, funding or financing for their uh, businesses, especially in the electric vehicle space. So I guess a uh, great uh, initiative by Sankalp team to put this very, very, uh, I think, very relevant topic in today's times uh, to talk on. And this is, I'm sure we'll keep talking and chatting as we go along. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Javi, you want to yes. say? Put your... I want final words. Final yes, words. please. please. Uh, uh, my suggestion here is electrical platform is uh, in uh, is uh, advanced stage, I can tell you. And I request all fundings uh, organizations and NBFC and bankers, let's not stay away from us. Try to know us, not watch from distance. Try to shake hand with us. You'll find a clear picture. And to better implement, this is the only best solution, what I believe. Government will make the policy will happen down line of two, three years. By this time, we will be lacking by two, three years. And public need today's solutions. So I request someone uh, should step in and should uh, minimize the gap between an okay. entrepreneur and startup and should make the thing happen there. Okay, Karthik, very quick closing remarks to, uh, you know, the people sitting out there listening to you. What would uh, your advice be to them? Jump in. I think this is a space that's going to define... Um, that, that's going to be a challenge. I mean, when, when you are kind of uh, changing a 100 plus year old industry, it's not going to happen in a day. There are going to be roadblocks, uh, but I think it's also very exciting. Um, I hear there are gaps, there are challenges. We are, because there are opportunities, we are trying to address those gaps and challenges. And the opportunities are enormous. And okay. therefore, I think it's a great time to be. Jump in. That's the word. Sabin. Um, yeah, I'm actually following Karthik a lot, <laughs> and, 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 and yeah, and, and I would say the same thing. I mean, I think uh, it, it's to I would I mean this is what I tell all of our uh, partners and and, and project developers uh, that work with us is uh, be bold uh, and, and 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 please bring us uh, stupid ideas that you know people they may think that's stupid, but it I mean. We we do look at very very risky projects, so uh, so you know um, bring those to us. I mean you know if uh, if people basically say that okay we can't finance it, send it over to us. Let's see if we can you know I think we can work out something because uh, um, and, and that, but but I say be bold. I mean I think uh, as Karthik said, this is a huge market. The potential is huge. Uh, if we don't take advantage of this right now, I think we're we're going to be looking at it on hindsight. Okay, so. boss, hey, don't miss the bus. Be simple, silly. Uh, uh, stupid, as they say, right? So there are uh, wonderful words of wisdom coming in. Thank you very much, all of you, for being uh, uh, for for sharing your thoughts and giving your inputs. Thank you, lovely uh, moderating this. Back to you, Ankit. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, 
Karthik Sabin and Jabir for joining us. And thank you so much, uh, Swati, for hosting, uh, for moderating this session. It was really useful and insightful for all of us. And I think the audience also participated a lot. Thank you so much, the audience, for asking those pertinent questions. And thank you, everyone, for answering them, uh, for them to also understand a little bit more about how IFS, GCF, as well as Kabira Mobile is thinking about revolution as in sector in the next few years and hopefully we will be you know it's not it's it's not the end of the panel it's a start i would say and we really want to bring everyone together uh, to actually have this discussions more and also join or collectively design or um, you know design some solutions which can revolutionize sector and support the larger consumer base that we have in india so looking forward to it thank you